make it out for this. Uh, it was our first year. Uh, I see some familiar faces in the room, but for folks who don't know me, uh, born and raised in this area, uh, very much part of this community. Uh, my sister has a small business here. My, my other sister lives in the area as well. So what's interesting is my family, they're refugees from Vietnam, and oftentimes you don't necessarily see uh, Asian people in leadership just because you know, you're supposed to be a doctor, a lawyer, engineer. So I'm kind of the black sheep <laughs> of the family. Uh, my brother's a doctor, my sister's an engineer, my other sister's an IT consultant. So I'm like the, the straggler from behind uh, in the Senate. But I'm very honored to be able to serve uh, this community. It's one where I grew up. Uh, it's one where I'm very much uh, ingrained in and we're raising our kids as well. Uh, this was our first year in the legislature this past year. I thought we had a, a decent year, um, if you're a Democrat at least. Uh, just because we had a huge majority, we're able to pass pretty effective legislation. So I'll talk a little bit about kind of what that process has been for me uh, as a first year member in the Senate, especially one that had zero experience uh, in politics. Uh, talks about some of the key wins that we had and also some, uh, some stuff there. And then really wanted to open up uh, for questions for people here. So my background is actually in finance and technology. So I studied finance, but I work in technology now and largely have been in the tech sector for the past few years. I'm a senior manager at Microsoft, managed a team uh, in our engineering org, and my background is specifically in data analytics. Uh, everybody talks about data as like the new thing. That's literally what I do for the largest company in the world. So it's kind of funny uh, being able to do legislation and you have folks working in that space as well, uh, and being able to actually um, build spreadsheets with them. People aren't used to members who are uh, competent in Excel, as it would on notice. Um, but it's been a fascinating journey. Uh, we ran last year against, I think, 11 people, fortunate enough to win in the general. Uh, this is my first time in the legislature, obviously. This is my first time uh, in any capacity. I haven't worked in there before, nor have I been a part of that process besides an advocate. And what's interesting is that that was actually a very, um, I think, beneficial uh, skill for us to have. So, for instance, in the legislature, there's about 4,000 bills that get introduced in any given year. Uh, only about two or 300 actually get passed. So oftentimes people think politics is about arguing if you're right or wrong. That's actually not the case. It's making sure that your issue is worthy of being discussed in the first place. So oftentimes we have folks who are part of that process that they don't necessarily reach out to other small businesses or folks in the community, and it isn't as if they don't care, it's just that it's not on the radar. Uh, we came in very much focused on working with the community. Uh, again, we weren't really beholden to anybody because we had no support really from anybody in the establishment. Uh, and one, because of the community, and that's really what we've been focused on. And I think that's why we've been able to have some success is because we worked on issues that are, are important but generally are overlooked because there's really no money or prestige associated with it. So I sit as the vice chair of human services. So we do all the social services stuff, everything from reentry and whatnot. I'm also on the Environment, Energy, and Technology Committee. I'll likely be the vice chair of that this year. Um, one cool and also sad thing is I'm probably the foremost expert in technology in the entire legislature, um, by far, like not even close, uh, uh, which is cool uh, because I definitely have a hand in terms of crafting legislation, which is very important, but also very scary is because I feel like I'm actually not that, I don't have that much experience in technology. <laughs> Um, I also serve on the Transportation Committee, which is very important for this district, given the ferries and our transit uh, stuff that we have going on. And then I'm also on a committee called Rules, which most folks don't actually know about. Um, again, what I said before is that there's 4,000 bills, only 200 actually pass. There's a gatekeeper uh, committee that then allows you to go to the floor. It's the Rules Committee. And what's funny is that most new people don't even know what that is. But that was the first committee that I wanted to be on, is because I was like, well, that's the, where the power is, because there's no point in passing legislation if you can't get it to the floor. Um, uh, so we serve on those four committees. I was one of six new members in the legislature this year, which is an interesting dynamic. Uh, and we were able to um, really rally around some very progressive things that happened this year in terms of some reform when it came to everything from taxes to education. One of the biggest things that we did was actually fund uh, the Washington State Scholarship. So basically any family in Washington State is guaranteed uh, public college education. So if your family makes under, yeah, thank you. So if your family makes um, under eight thousand dollars a year, uh, you're basically guaranteed access to college education, all the way up to about ninety thousand dollars a year, which would be partially subsidized as well. And largely, it's uh, Microsoft and Amazon that helped fund that effort through uh, a BNO reform that they themselves pushed. So what's interesting to me is that we are able to have um, a, a private-public partnership 
to do good things for our community and in relations with one another as well. Um, we focus a lot on the energy and the environment, everything from reform for uh, building codes to things associated with electrification of basically everything. Uh, Jay Inzi has been a great leader in that space. Uh, I do a lot of stuff on the social services and justice reform side. I don't know if folks are necessarily excited about that uh, in this room, but that's one of the biggest things for me is in terms of making sure that the systems that we have in place works for everybody as well. Uh, along those lines, also do a lot of stuff on alleviating homelessness. Uh, interesting fact is that it's actually three times cheaper to keep somebody housed than it is to take them out of homelessness. So a lot of work is being done to make sure they don't become homeless in the first place to make it easier to keep them uh, safe and sound and not necessarily uh, have to deal with it after the fact. So those are some of the biggest things that we worked on. Also a lot of justice issues. Again, I don't know if everybody cares, but marijuana conviction is one of the biggest things where uh, for things that are now legal, people have criminal records uh, because of them, and I wanted to vacate them just because uh, it causes an undue burden, everything from getting a loan uh, for school, housing, uh, getting a job, uh, which then leads to issues with you know homelessness as well. So fixing that issue, um, what else? Prepaid postage, access to democracy is very important to me. So in King County, we have prepaid postage for the past few cycles. That's not necessarily true in Washington State. So we were able to allocate funding in order to make sure that every ballot in Washington State is just covered. So there's no excuse uh, for not being able to vote. Um, some of the more important things specifically to this district, we're able to actually allocate about $47 million uh, to this district in terms of projects being done here. Uh, to give you context, usually it's about $25 million per district. We were able to get $47 million. Uh, I would like to say that was my effort, but largely it's because of a whole host of things. For instance, uh, Terminal 5. Anybody work with Terminal 5? So that is a huge deal. Yeah. Oh, yes. The poor people, of course. <laughs> I see you guys. Good work. Um, so Terminal 5 is going to come back online pretty soon. And one of the biggest things for us is to make sure that that was uh, a good project, not just for Washington State, but for this community as well. So for people who live near the port, um, it would have been pretty detrimental to have all these boats coming in with their engines on full blast, having the smokes coming, having the smoke coming out, and being very loud. So it was important for me to allocate money towards Terminal 5 to electrify the terminals. So basically when they come in, they'll plug in, the engines turn off, there's no emissions, and there's no sound. So we can have a robust economy in Washington State without necessarily um, impacting the community in a negative way. So that's one of the things. We provided funding for South Seattle Community Colleges uh, to uh, help upgrade some of their facilities. Uh, we're able to get funding for Mary's Place, I'm not sure if it's involved with Mary's Place, to pay, pay down the Bering Project, um, because it was important for us to make that investment in this community. Uh, we even got some funding for some green spaces in West Seattle as well, amongst a whole host of things. Uh, one of the biggest things, I'm not sure if folks uh, rely on the ferry system, that is a very important deal for us in West Seattle. Uh, the ferry system uh, has been grossly underfunded because of some initiatives in the past, but one of the things was that the contract for the ferries was about to expire, which means we would not have new ferries, considering most of them are about 60 years old. That was pretty important. Um, and also, it's not very uh, popular to ask for money to buy a ferry when really only a few key districts uh, have them. So we were able to actually negotiate a way to pay for a new ferry, extend the contract, which actually means that we'll get ferries about three or four years faster and about $30 million cheaper, so we don't have to actually go back for an RFP process as well. So the biggest things for us was making sure that we're being good stewards of the money that we have, being mindful of the work being done in our community, but also making sure that we're uplifting voices uh, that were there uh, who were not necessarily involved uh, usually. When I was walking in, what's kind of interesting is that, um, uh, I'll just give you kind of the behind the scenes. There are lobbyists that work in Olympia, some of them are good, some of them are bad. Port ones are good, obviously. Um, and, and they're called the third house. I'm not sure you, if you know this, which is honestly very arrogant because it's the Senate and the House, and to call yourself the third house is very telling of kind of their relationship with some of the members. Um, and again, some of them are good, some of them are bad. And one of the biggest things for us is to make sure that we're fighting for folks who don't necessarily can afford the expensive lobbyists. And that's actually a small business community is one of them. So certainly some of the larger corporations have a very strong presence down there. Uh, I would argue that the, the smaller businesses don't necessarily have that. Guy Colombo is one of the biggest champions for small businesses. And I actually proposed legislation to reform BNO. I tried to exempt about 73% of businesses from BNO altogether by raising the threshold um, for a certain amount. 
So for me personally, I think B&O is kind of a ridiculous thing where you pay, even though you know it's <laughs> You may or may not make money, but you still have to pay for it, right? So um, I was trying to raise that threshold so that way if you made under X amount of dollars, I think it was 250, you would just be exempt from B&O. And then we refine that by having, say for instance, Microsoft and Amazon uh, pick up the differences because for them, that rate is actually very small, but if you're a small mom pot shop, it's pretty big. Uh, that didn't necessarily pass this year, but we started that conversation. There are things like that that are available as well. Um, so I, my, my breadth of portfolio of work that we do is pretty wide. So I'm happy to actually just answer questions associated with kind of what your group is. Because obviously it's very different. If I'm talking to young kids and stuff, is very different. So I'd be happy to answer questions. I can keep rambling if you like. Oh, you have hands already, so we'll just go with that. Let's go. Pete. Sorry, oh, yeah. When you hear the question, if you could repeat it into the mic, because I don't think everybody's going to be able to hear. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. In light of the recent appeal court decision on the city of San Jose income tax, yeah. do you think the state legislature will take that issue up within the next it's not our jurisdiction, it's the Supreme Court. So the next step is actually the Supreme Court to rule on it. And then from there, it's anybody's guess. I mean, obviously, some of the more progressive folks, myself included, would rather us lower property taxes and sales taxes. And the only way to do that really is through a more equitable income tax. So the biggest thing is how you would actually um, set up that mechanism to be more equitable. But right now, it's kind of up in the air. So it depends on what the Supreme Court decides. Yeah. So first off, huge thanks to the Terminal Plan Investment and for all the work on the Energy Committee. We, we at the port um, prioritize the low carbon fuel standard, and you mentioned reducing impact from the terminals, airport, airplanes uh, are also a community impact, and we're, we're trying to get our sustainable aviation fuels off the ground. So we got close last year. I wonder if you could just share your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an optimist. Anyway, I wonder if you could just share some thoughts about yeah. in a 60 day session, you know, yeah. whether, whether we're here. So the first question was about um, the new ruling on income tax in Seattle. So in case anybody didn't hear, hear that question. This second question is about low carbon fuel standards. So in Washington State, we don't have a low carbon fuel standards right now. And that's for a couple of reasons. But the reason why it's so important for the port is that if you want to reduce emissions in a particular matter in the air for our fleets, we actually need to have one. California has one. And we actually produce low carbon fuels in Washington State but it's more uh, lucrative for them to sell it outside of the state, so we don't actually utilize them. Um, and the, the, the question here is, is it possible to have one in Washington State? And the answer is, maybe. Um, so there's politics behind it. Uh, the chair of transportation is a person named Steve Hobbs, who's very passionate about the committee. We also have a um, governor who's very passionate about the environment. And they kind of are diametrically opposed at this point in terms of their perspectives for low carbon fuel standards. Uh, the only way that I can see that passing is either we have a new chair or a new governor. Like they, if you look up low carbon fuel standards and type in the governor's name, there's going to be a whole host of articles about the battles that they've had to fight. So the perspective of the chair of transportation is that it's going to raise um, the cost of fuel and with the gas tax is already too high. And the perspective of the governor is that he's not going to pass any um, transportation budget um, that doesn't have one. So we're literally at a impasse right now where uh, the transportation budget is is stuck. Um, we passed a small version of a transportation budget this year just to fund basic maintenance, uh, but oftentimes the budget process is every two years. So we passed an operating budget. Transportation budget historically has taken two or three years to pass after they've already expired. Uh, and that's likely to be on track this year as well. So, so every, I think people are very much engaged. It's um, we'll have to do some convincing to make sure it works. Yeah, let's go with you. Um, so I just have a few things. Do you ever sleep? Um, what, what don't you do? And have you taken a sabbatical from Microsoft to take on all the projects, or are you just giving only half of what you are obviously capable of doing, which you probably could do more because you're yeah. still working at Microsoft? Yeah. And then another one, uh, Seattle Parks Department, they, um, I know they only have a specific amount of funding, but one of the most popular places in the city is Alki, mm -hmm. and it's not clean. Mm -hmm. um, it needs a lot more care, especially on the weekends, because garbage is overflow constantly. I know there's also consistent uh, problems in the junction when there's festivals and yeah. events and such like that. So is that something that, that you can take care of or that you can try and advocate for? Yeah, so there's two questions. You, did you read the article about me? Is that why you asked that question? No, I'm just... <laughs> 
like, you do so much. And I'm oh. like, wait, you can't be working at Microsoft also. And I am, so. He has three kids. Obviously, you don't sleep because you have three kids. Yeah. But, I mean, you're taking on a lot. Uh, well so, the first question is, do I sleep? And the answer is not very much. You actually get about three or four hours of sleep a night, and I have an app that tracks it. Um, <laughs> and and that, there's actually an article about my lack of sleep, which is kind of funny. Uh, I'm still working full-time at Microsoft. Um, technically, we're part-time legislatures, so we're not actually being compensated for the rest of the year. I can't tell if this is on. Is this on? It just says low battery. Okay, oh, we've got batteries. Yeah, no worries. Um, <laughs> So I am not taking time off right now. Uh, I will take time off during the legislative session. So I have a newborn kid at home as well. So usually my day starts at about 5.30 and I end at about 1. Um, and it's because I'm very impatient and I believe that there's a lot of work to be done in our community. And candidly, after my first year, I'm a little bit pissed off as well just because I've seen how inefficient things are um, down in Olympia, also in other places. And you'd be surprised at how much you can get done by just showing up. So um, it's kind of this fine balance that I have to walk with my wife is uh, how do you keep doing work without alienating <laughs> the people you care about. So uh, that's, that's where I'm at. And then the second part of the question was about the parks and more funding to, to clean up uh, Alki and the specific the junction itself. So obviously that's not necessarily my jurisdiction, but I will work with the city council to figure out what that might entail. Um, there isn't necessarily funding from the state level to kind of pay for things like that. But what we can do is, for instance, uh, they have capital projects associated with either schools or with uh, child care resources or community centers. Maybe we could figure out ways to fund those things on their behalf so that we can create more money uh, for, for cleaning up the parks as well. So I'll reach out to Lisa, who would be uh, the person for that. Yeah. Great segue. This is an election year. Yeah, so it is. Our council member in district has used the term Chamber of Commerce quite pejoratively recently. Yeah. And she will continue to do so through this election cycle. That doesn't feel good to this body, founded in 1923. I'm past chair of this body. And I'm just, I'd, I'd like your opinion on uh, the fact that, Senator, you did endorse uh, candidate Herbold for this election cycle. So I'd like you to sort of comment on that. Yeah, so the question was, is the Chamber of Commerce bad? I think is was the question. Essentially, that's yeah. how we're treated by the, the incumbent. Yeah, well, I think there's two folds. Um, I think, to me, uh, the West Idaho Chamber of Commerce is very different than the Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce is one. And also, small businesses are very different than Amazon's and Microsoft's. So I think, uh, in my mind, her perspective is large on the Amazon side, because she's been working very hard to build a relationship with the small businesses. Uh, I don't think, or, or not, I don't know. But yeah. She was going to disagree. Yeah. So for me, personally, I think that uh, there's an effective partnership in this space, for instance, with the funding for schools. Uh, Amazon and Microsoft stepped up to help fund education for Washington State, and there are things that we can do together as well. I do believe that there is certainly a power dynamic where certain groups have much more influence, and I don't think it's actually the small businesses. I'm more targeting uh, the larger corporations as well. So I think that there is more that we could be doing in terms of working with our small businesses. I feel like the big businesses who are worth literally over a trillion dollars are doing just fine. And that's where my interests lie. Um, I'm more interested in working with small businesses to figure out how we can actually have uh, a partnership that works for uh, the community here and for the small businesses as well. So for context, small businesses provide the majority of jobs in Washington State, right? So if you talk about alleviating poverty, you talk about uplifting communities, it is done by small businesses. My family had a small business when we first came over from Vietnam. They had a billiards hall in White Center. My sister has one as well. So I want to make a very clear distinction in terms of Amazon and Microsoft are very different than mom and pop shops in West Seattle. So I do think that folks like Amazon and Microsoft can stand to pay their fair share in taxes. I think we need to lower taxes for folks that are here uh, in, in the community that are, you know, this is their livelihood, this is kind of what they're doing as well, and make sure that we have that perspective. So even when we talk about tax reform or things like capital gains, I was very, very passionate about making sure that there were certain exemptions in place. So for instance, if you were to sell your business, oftentimes your business is your retirement account. And I did not want that to be hit by any proposals by capital gains. So we exempted the first $60 million for businesses, so that way you would not be hit by, potentially, if you're making over $60 million, I think you're going to be just fine. <laughs> in my mind, I don't know, maybe, maybe you have a different lifestyle. Um, and also, uh, uh, you know, property was exempt. Uh, equipment was exempt as well. So things like that where I think there's opportunities to have a partnership. So I don't necessarily view the chamber as a, a negative thing. 
me personally, it's not really my, they're not my stakeholders. I don't know if they, I don't know how they feel about me. Um, but, you know, I'm not opposed to them by any means, but I'm also more concerned about small businesses and want to make a clear distinction between that and like larger corporations. Does that answer your question? It does. And yeah. for the record, I was on the phone with the downtown chamber this morning. They spoke very highly of you. I said, Oh, so, well, that's good to know. So you're in their corner. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anybody else that. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, how do we make things more affordable so we can actually attract workers here? Um, and one of the things that we did was reform the condo liability laws. Do folks know about the condo liability law? I'll give you a quick context. So right now, if you build, or actually no, as of this past month, it's gone. So before J July, um, if you were to build a condo, you had like a 99.9% .9 of getting sued just because. Because the laws were set up in a way where it is very easy. Um, to sue folks for damages in condos, and what would happen is that you would just settle. So they're not suing you, or not suing the development because there's something wrong, they just they're gonna settlement, they're gonna get settlement. Um, so we changed that, so that can't happen anymore going forward, which ideally would open up some of the supply for condos. Uh, we also um, are working towards more affordable housing. One of the first ways was that, this is the first year we had an actual committee on housing and affordability, uh, uh, headed up by uh, Senator Kuderer. So that was one of the first things that we've done is actually structure a committee to address these issues specifically. And we also put money towards um, the housing trust fund, which builds more affordable housing. And then there's also zoning things that you can play with as well. So I think this is very much on the forefront of people's minds. One of the biggest things that it becomes challenging is how do you do this in a way that doesn't necessarily overly disrupts the dynamic of a neighborhood? Because oftentimes people don't necessarily want more density. Sometimes they do want more density. And so it's being mindful of how can the state act to empower local municipalities to do what they need to have more affordable housing, um, but not necessarily overstep our bounds. So there was one of these conversations when we were voting on some legislation for ADUs, and literally the discussion was, well, do we really want some senator from Spokane legislating zoning for a person in Seattle? Right, so there's kind of that fine balance. So absent of investing more in affordable housing, which we're doing, um, the Housing Trust Fund, which folks don't know, funds uh, developments for more affordable housing. We added $150 million towards that effort over the next two years. Um, it was actually kind of interesting because $25 million was because of uh, some discussions that I had. Uh, we've uh, lowered REITs for about 98% of properties in Washington State as well. So REITs, this audience probably knows, when you sell your property, you pay a REIT. Um, for properties up to 1.5, you're going to be paying less than what you before. 1.5 to 3 million, it's a, uh, the same and then above three million, it is a little bit more. Um, so the idea there was to make sure that if you're selling or buying property in that tier below, um, it'd be more affordable as well. So the answer is yes, there's a whole host of things being done. Uh, Senator Kuderer is leading efforts on those, but I think that's probably one of the most important things they're working on um, to not just alleviate you know, costs, but also you know, homelessness issues as well. Yeah, I think, the, so the question was condo conversions. I don't know the state, I think you're allowed to do that anyway. I don't think you need state legislation to do that, right? Um, no, there's, there's still more liability and um, some pathways need to be smooth. Okay. Developers to do the condo conversions. Yeah, happy to chat afterwards. That's not in my purview, so I'm not on the committee, nor... Um, That's the next thing. Yeah. For what they just recently did. Okay, yeah, be happy to chat more about, so the question was about condo conversions and how to make that path easier. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> what does the Senate define affordability as? Oh, affordability, oh, that math is so bad. So what's funny is if you look at <laughs> Because it's obviously not what everybody oh, it's not good. thinks it is. So what ends up happening oftentimes is everything is based off of what's called AMI. But then, like, say, for instance, they define, you know, how much affordable housing costs based off of AMI, which is different than how much a person actually makes to qualify for some of these benefits. So, if it, so essentially, you'll have situations where 
affordable housing for a rental unit is like $1,100. But in order to qualify for that, you can only make like $15,000 a year. So it's like, there's a huge gap between being able to afford an affordable house and, and actually rent. being able to qualify for yeah. it. People can't pay that rent if that's all they're making. Yeah, exactly. So that's actually one of the problems that I think needs to be addressed is actually having the left hand talk to the right hand. So we're trying to provide services to keep people housed, and we're setting rates for what uh, affordable housing should be in terms of rental cost. They should actually be based off of reality. What's funny is I was looking on Redfin way back um, at Condos a while ago, and I was like, wow, this place is really cheap, and realized it was because it was uh, affordable housing and you had to make a certain amount. And then what's funny is I did the math on it, and it was like, well, if you got like a regular mortgage 20% down, there's no way you'd be able to afford this place. It's because you're still going to be spending 80% of your, your, your salary on it. So it's been on the market. It had been on the market for like over a year in Seattle during this time. So it's things like that where I think policy is maybe not necessarily uh, necessary, but in implementation. Um, so for folks who don't know, the legislature creates policy, and then the different departments implements policy. And oftentimes those two don't really go hand in hand, which is something that I've noticed as well, where sitting on the implementation committee is actually very, very important. I also serve not just on the committees um, within the legislature, I serve on other committees outside of it as well. Uh, one of it is the building codes and standards to make sure that we're doing a good job at, um, at regulating those. I also serve on the autonomous vehicles task force because those are coming forward as well. Um, and I serve on a, a couple of other ones. Um, LEAP, which is they, it's the IT department for Washington State. Their budget is like $20 million a year. And again, nobody with a tech background is on it, which is very strange to me. Um, so I'll probably be taking over that one pretty soon. Um, so not here nor there. But, um, but yeah, I think that's actually a huge concern that we need to be addressed in terms of how do you marry up what is available in terms of support with the reality of the cost of living here as well. Pete? So one of the things that I enjoyed during the session was your videos. Oh, thanks. And, uh, because they were quite informative. Yeah. But I will have two questions. Why do you walk so fast? <laughs> and did anybody fall down and get hurt during the filming of those videos? Because that is just, I, the people that you were interviewing, it was like, they're just rushing to keep up with you and talk at the same time. And by the end of the video, they're out, out of breath. breath. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I was just curious. You gotta get back to Redfin. You gotta get back to Because they were, I mean, they were quite informative. Good. They covered a number of different topics. Yeah, so we, um, the question was about, we, we make, so we communicate in a very different style than I think just about everybody in the legislature. And one of the things that we do is walk and talks. So my staff um, will, will film as I'm walking and we're talking about a topic that just either happened or we wanted to share. And the first time we did it was actually out of necessity. So I was going from one meeting to the next. So on average, people take about six or seven meetings per day in, legis in, the, in the legislature. Um, I do about 16. So we go from one spot to the next spot, and oftentimes I'll take meetings as I'm walking to the next meeting. And we just decided that we didn't have time to actually communicate, so he would just have the camera ready and a microphone, and I would walk and then talk about whatever. Um, and really the reason why we do that is because this process is not very transparent, and it impacts us on a very real basis. And I wanted folks to understand how this works, because it is uh, more your your process and more your space than it is any of the legislators that are there. So we did this video it's just because we wanted to shed light on some of the, the things that people don't normally see in the legislature or in our government and be more accountable and transparent to what we were doing as well. So I appreciate you acknowledging that. Um, and, and we did walk very fast. I think there was one with Hillary France, and she was like out of breath. And she's fit too, don't get me wrong. But we were like walking upstairs and stuff like that. And I don't know, I, I'm always in a hurry. So it's, it always makes me nervous to like not walk fast. I feel like I'm late for something. So next next year I'll try to slow it down. <laughs> well, I think that was part of it. Was, was and you just it seemed like you had so much information that you wanted to convey. And you realized that you have a minute that, that you had yeah. that you had a short period. Yeah. No, there's so much, and that's one of the biggest things too. Is I would love to get folks more involved in the political process. Is is broken? Like I'll be candid with you. I feel like. Right now, the way that it's set up, you either have to be wealthy or, or lobbyists down there to get stuff done very quickly. And we kind of shunned all of that. We really wanted to make sure that we uplifted the voices of people that are here. So whenever we have legislation that impacted real people, I tried to bring them into the space. We even have legislation that would have impacted folks who were currently in prison. So I was able to convince the committee to do a Skype 
uh, session with folks at Monroe, right? We had legislation that was going to impact folks in the homelessness community. So I invited folks from Camp Second Chance down to Olympia. Uh, we even had legislation that protected um, vulnerable workers, uh, including adult entertainers. And we had Stormy Daniels come up and then testify as well. So my whole point was making sure that I wanted regular people who were impacted by legislation to be part of the process. Because right now, it's generally um, members who oftentimes don't know what they're doing. Um, and lobbyists who are doing it for uh, financial gain, and I, I don't like that. So, <clears throat> just a, a serious question. Okay. So, um, one of the things that we see is, is a homeless population existing on the sides of our interstates, yeah. on state-owned driver way. That's right. And, and I know that there was some additional funding approved in this budget. Three million, I think it was. To, uh, to deal with that, but... Is it still working its way through the bureaucracy to get something done? Because no, so there, so the so the question was: um, a lot of folks um, are experiencing homelessness are on right of ways owned by the state. So Washtenaw already is doing that. So it, it, there was no really bureaucracy; they're already um, cleaning up and handling it. It was just funding those teams because initially they were doing it and burning a hole through their budget and not being able to do something else. So this is just kind of augmenting that work. So there shouldn't be one. We'll go with you and then you in the corner over there. So I appreciate you being transparent and bringing all that. I'm curious, with the new state free postage, yeah. has that increased how many people actually vote? Yeah, so if you look at King County, um, so King County has been doing it for a little while, and then the rest of the state will now partake in it as well. So we'll know after this cycle what the state numbers are. But certainly King County, we saw a bump up associated with it, just because, at least in my generation, Somebody asked me to write a check the other day, and I was like, God dang it, I'm going to go find a check. I'm going to mail it with the stamp. Um, so um, we actually did. So I don't know if anybody else feels the same way. Uh, yeah. But we saw, uh, in terms of the, the percentage increases, were actually from either low income communities or members of color or younger people as well, just because they were able to just kind of put it through. Oftentimes, that barrier is enough to just dissuade people. So for us, it's more access to democracy to make sure that. There really is no excuse for not being in the Senate back. Uh, you have a question back there. So my question is about homelessness again, and uh, it has to do with my experience reporting campsites, uh, specifically next to the Rotary Totem Pole on 35th and uh, West Seattle Golf Course. The police department says, uh, thanks, but, you know, I'm not going to do anything. Uh, <clears throat> so there's that side of the issue, and then the other article that I read said this county spends seven hundred million dollars a year through a hundred different agencies uh, addressing homelessness, and yet for much less than that, we could actually take care of the problem. So, what does the state legislature? Where is homelessness on the state legislature's priority list, and how many counties are affected by King County? Uh, I think all counties are impacted by homelessness at this point. And from the state perspective, so the Affordable Housing Committee is also called homelessness as well. So we created a new committee specific to address these issues and really to go after the root causes of homelessness. If you look at the number of folks who are homeless in this area at least, the vast majority, over 50 percent, are either um, in a senior uh, demographic or have some type of disability. So in my mind, the, the real way to address those issues is to provide support for folks who need it um, so they don't become vulnerable in the first, first place. We also know that when housing affordability becomes uh, too great, there's a direct correlation to homelessness. So for every $100 increase in rent per month, there's about a 10% increase in the homeless population that we've seen in the past. So I think it goes hand in hand with making sure that we have more affordable housing. Also, something that people don't actually know is during the recession, so back in you know 2011, when our economy went down, we made some pretty drastic cuts. I mean, not me, because I wasn't there but there were drastic cuts done to social services, everything from mental health, uh, everything from um, prevention, homelessness prevention. There's a program called HENS, Housing and Emergency Services, specifically for senior citizens. Those were all cut, and they haven't been brought back to the funding levels that they were before. So to me, I'm not actually surprised. I've been helping out on this homelessness issue uh, since I was in college. There's a professor of mine who worked at DESC, and we've been studying this issue for a long time. So I'll be candid, uh, seeing homelessness uh, becoming an issue today uh, was not a surprise to me because I saw the cuts being made decades ago and I saw that we had kind of rampant uh, growth in our housing as well. 
Uh, you know, partly due because of a good thing, our economy has gotten stronger, but we didn't do it in a way that was mindful of the people that were already here. So, uh, long story short, uh, the state is doing a lot to try to alleviate this situation by, in my mind, uh, trying to keep people housed in the first place. Um, and that's also why I've partnered up with Mary's Place, because they do provide services that we believe are data-driven and work. Um, and that's why we allocated funding for them to help uh, maintain their facility uh, in Burien and also in, in the White Center community as well. Because I think this takes uh, a lot of effort from not just the state, but the county and the city. Um, and I'll be, I'll be candid, uh, I think the number you're quoting is from the, the Puget Business Journal. I think it was actually a billion dollars, which is their estimate. So that number, um, to me, is a little bit inflated because it includes things that are not necessarily under the jurisdiction of the lo local governments. But one of the things that I would agree with is that there hasn't been enough uh, regional um, co collaboration to address this issue. Uh, oftentimes you'll see the city do something, the state will do something, and the county will do something, and they don't necessarily talk. So one of the things that I'm doing right now, my LA, uh, my legislative assistant always makes fun of me for doing this, but like I'll just say things like, I'm just going to solve homelessness, and I say it very casually. I'm going to do this, and I say it very casually. She's like, uh, that's not a thing. And I'm like, no, it's going to be a thing. <laughs> um, so one of the things that we are doing is that we're meeting with regional partners uh, regarding homelessness issues, just trying to understand what is being done right now, and then seeing how we can augment and support one another instead of cannibalizing some of the work. Um, it's kind of like the 80-20 rule, uh, in fact. So if you look at most of the folks who are homeless, I think 80% of them, they're transitory. It's one time, missed a paycheck, couldn't pay rent, uh, had a medical emergency. Um, we're actually able to address a lot of their needs with very little cost. Uh, we do that at Wellspring Family Services, which is the nonprofit that I support. And they're able to keep people housed. They are alleviating homelessness by keeping people housed. So I think if we were to devote our energy towards keeping people housed and rapid rehousing and providing services around them, you will actually see economies of scale. So right now, about 20% of the homelessness population eats up uh, the majority of the budget because they're chronically homeless. Uh, and that's why there are somewhat controversial spaces where it's easier and cheaper just to house them. Politically, it's kind of you know all over the place. I personally support it because it saves us money in the long term and it's the right thing to do. And by doing that, we're actually able to free up resources elsewhere to then address the actual issue. So for me, I think to solve homelessness, we actually need to keep people housed in the first place. And if you look at the fact that most of them are actually senior citizens or have some sort of disability, uh, it's actually an issue that I think we have um, you know safety nets in place, but they haven't been funded at a level that would have made sense, you know, in 2011. Uh, we'll go with you, and then you. Can you talk about how the average uh, person on the street, your constituents, can make an effect at, at the legislature? What, how can they participate to help pass yeah. these bills? Or I think if you're passionate, I mean, the main thing is if you're passionate about an issue, like, bring it up. Because, like I said before, um, if you're not at the table, you're basically on the menu, right? So, like, I only know what you tell me. And oftentimes, if you look at the dynamic of the legislature, um, and this, you know, this is, so, here, to give you a little more context, uh, we had six new members in the legislature. Um, and there are now, uh, we almost doubled in the amount of people of color in the Senate. That number is now eight people. At one point, there was only one woman of color in the entire Senate that was from the Jayapal. Right? So like, oftentimes, perspectives are missing. And uh, if you look at how the, the legislative process works, uh, certainly lobbyists, certainly people who fund campaigns have greater access than regular working class families and regular small businesses. So the biggest thing is, um, it is your right to send us notes and emails and phone calls and let us know the issues that are of concern to you. And it helps if you have stakeholders who are involved that can identify these issues, but also uh, support in terms of the advocacy efforts. So there are organizations that do this right now, but oftentimes they're not regular people they are in the political game. Um, for me, we spend a lot of time outreach in the community, either in town halls. Uh, we reach out to all the high schools to want more, more students to be involved as well. So honestly, the biggest thing you can do is show up. If you see that there's a problem, give me a call. Um, we're probably more... Um, receptive and more responsive than, than most folks. Do you send out a regular newsletter or a legislative update? No, I actually don't because I, I feel like um, they're not as, the, the response rates are not usually great uh, for those things. Um, I do a lot of community events and we do a lot of things on social media. I can, if there's an appetite for newsletters and whatnot, I'll just, whenever I get them, they go to my spam folder. 
Like his Facebook page. Yeah, if you like our Facebook page, that's probably the best way to be engaged. Because you get, you get so much information, and you also get to watch his videos. <laughs> <laughs> also, um, bills that you are sponsoring that come up for hearings, you'd like us to come down and testify yeah. or show up and just sign in and say we either yeah. support or... Yeah, that, that'd be fantastic. Um, but we, the average person doesn't know how to do that. No, yeah, you're absolutely right. It really it is. Isn't. Have you gone down before to testify? Is that how you know? Yeah. It, it's actually very important. So there are some controversial bills where it's handled, but there are a vast majority of bills where it does take a little bit of community support and voice. And I'll be, I'll be kidding. There have been times where I'm like, I don't know about this bill, and somebody testifies. I'm like, oh, I didn't realize that was a perspective to be had. So, you know, play by ear. Obviously, it takes a lot of resource and time to go down to Olympia. Uh, but if it's an issue that you care about, that especially if it's not like a highly visible politicized one, it is worthwhile to go down and testify in committee. That, that process is also very difficult because it happens very fast. So from the moment you drop a bill to when you get scheduled for a hearing, it can happen between 30 minutes, a few days, a few weeks. Um, so you're right, there That's are ways to track. So yeah. I get notified. I get notified. Okay. There's a, a bill. So if I can't get down there, I'll call. Yeah. Or call the committee. You call the committee or the committee head. Yeah. No, that's perfect. I'll, you know, I'll set someone. I've been reluctantly doing it. Because I was more focused on like the media and the outreach, but I'll, I'll, I'll set someone up. Two minutes. Oh, two minutes. Oh, wow, that's actually pretty quick. I saw, I saw you, yeah. I was just curious, and I might have missed it. I hear you completely around um, homelessness and keeping people out of homelessness in the first place is a really smart thing to do, and I agree with that. But what are you, what's actually happening for the people who are currently homeless? Yeah. So the question was, um, I think everybody agrees that keeping people housed is a good thing to do. What happens when they're already homeless? So I volunteer at Camp Second Chance, uh, which is an encampment down in White Center. And I believe that we need to have spaces where we get people off the streets and then get them in a safe spot where they can get services as well. Um, the city of Seattle handles their thing. Uh, for me personally, I believe uh, we need to have more housing to get folks off. And that's actually why we have legislation to allow for a more streamlined approach to having these types of encampments because folks are already out on the streets. Right. I'd rather have them in a safe place where we can provide services versus, you know, everywhere. Um, I personally don't think sweeps work. Uh, I think they're expensive. Uh, they're not really humane. And I'd rather provide an area where we could have a safe place with plumbing, with electricity, and with uh, the support necessary to, to be able to, to get that done. And I'll be candid. Like, I... Some of my positions are actually very controversial just because I don't actually care about getting reelected, um, and I just want to get the job done. So you probably won't agree with me on everything, but for the most part, I think our values are aligned in terms of wanting to do the right thing for the community. So for me, that's making sure that we get people housed faster so that way we can get them stable. So Camp Second Chance, for instance, many of the members actually are going into stable housing because of their experience there. So oftentimes, folks who become homeless are experiencing some kind of crisis. And if we're able to stabilize them, that actually gets them in a safe spot. Cool. I like yeah. that. Okay. Thank you Perfect. so much.